ಗಣಪತಿಗುಂಭವಾಮಹೆ ಕವಿ ಕವೀನಾಪಮಶ್ರವಸ್ತಮ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣಸ್ಪತ ಆನ ಶೃಣ್ವನ್ನೋತಿ ಸೇದ ಸಾಧನ ಪ್ರಣೋದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವಾಜೇಭಿರ್ವಾಜಿನೀವತಿ ಧೀನಾಮವಿತ್ರಯವತು ಗಣೇಶಾಯ ನಮಃ ಸರಸ್ವತ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓ ಶ್ರೀ ಸೈರಾಮ್ ಐ ಆಫರ್ ಮೈ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಲವಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ಸ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಫೀಟ್ of bhagwan shri satya sai baba a loving sai ram and the heartiest welcome to you all back to the much awaited satsang series satsangatve ni sangatum i am anita vidyalata a proud participant of the batch 2020 and currently discharging my duties as one of the org team members of the most prestigious shri satya sai national leadership program dear sisters and brothers I know that you all have been waiting eagerly for the sessions to be held. So without much further delay, I hand over to the AV team to introduce our guest for today's evening. Sai Ram. ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಸೈರಾಮ್ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಸತ್ಯ ಸಾಯಿ ಬಾಬಾ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಆಫನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೌಂಡೆಡ್ ದಟ್ ಬೈ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಸ್ಟರಿಟೀಸ್ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಫಾರ್ಮ್ಡ್ ಇಂಟು ಪ್ಯೋರ್ ಸೋಲ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಟುಡೇ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಫಾರ್ಚ್ಯೂನ್ ಆಫ್ ರಿಸೀವಿಂಗ್ ಮೆನಿ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಸುಪ್ರೀಮ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ಹಿಮ್ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ we have amidst us shri ss naganand trustee shri satyasai central trust prashanti nilayam shri naganand was born as the second son of late shri s g sundaraswami an eminent senior advocate and former advocate general of karnataka from 1971 to 1972 who was not only an ardent devotee of bhagwan but was also blessed to be a member of the council of management of the shri satya sai trust karnataka after having taken a degree in bcom from the st joseph's college of commerce at bengaluru in 1977 he also bagged three gold medals as he completed his llb from Renukacharya College, Bengaluru in 1980. In the same year, he also qualified as a chartered accountant with a national merit rank to his credit. He is also a diploma holder in French language and civilization from the prestigious Alliance Francaise at Bengaluru. He started practice as a chartered accountant in 1981 and later the same year as an advocate in his father's chambers Sundaraswami and Ramdas Advocates. He was designated senior advocate by the High Court of Karnataka in 2003. Sri Naganand appears regularly in the Supreme Court of India international arbitrations and in Karnataka and all other high courts in India and many tribunals in the areas of arbitration, constitutional law, infrastructure law, intellectual property law, company law and taxation. In 2008, Sri Naganand founded a law firm known as Just Law at Bengaluru. currently 
a vice president of the bar association of india he has also been president of the karnataka section of the international commission of jurists sir is the chairman of maharani lakshmi ammane college trust and in addition is serving as trustee of vedanta bharati which publishes many books on hindu philosophy and of sanskrit bharati which propagates spoken sanskrit an ardent devotee of bhagwan shri satya sai baba shri naganand is a trustee of the shri satya sai central trust the trust of shri satya sai institute of higher learning and a member of the board of management of the shri satya sai institute of higher learning an erudite scholar who has traveled widely and is a polyglot fluent in nine languages he has written a commentary on shri adi shankaracharya's prashnottara ratnamalika which was released in october 2017 at bengaluru during the saundarya lahiri mahasamarpan graced by the prime minister of india shri narendra modi he wrote an english commentary on a concise version entitled vivek deepine which has been translated into 10 indian languages and was released by the vice president of india shri venkaiah naidu at delhi in july 2019 Sir has also authored a book entitled Story of the Clan which expounds the great legacy of his family. Sir has been conferred upon with a special honor in being recognized as a living legend in law by the Bar Association of India in December 2020. Shri Naganand and his wife Shrimati Madhuri are blessed with three daughters all lawyers and have four grandchildren all of whom are blessed to be basking in the love and grace of beloved bhagwan Dear brothers and sisters let us extend a very warm welcome to Shri Naganand and invite him to share with us his learnings in life with bhagwan shri satya sai baba shri s s naganand jay sai ram sai ram sir uh, we welcome you to to today's satsang and we can't wait to hear from you sir requesting you to please render your speech jay sai ram uh Sai Ram to all of you, Gopi ji and the band of young people who are uh, assembling on Sunday evenings for this satsang. At the outset, I'd like to pay obeisance with loving pranams and reverential namaskar to Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba. These words of loving pranam. they have a certain important significance it uh, orients our mind towards a divine force it's not just some words but those words have to transport your mind to some place this evening uh, they've been uh, asking me to speak on learnings of life now before i do that i want to quote from Adi Shankaracharya in Prashnot Ratnamalika, one of the verses. Bhagavan Kimupadeyam is a question. Guru Vachanam Heyam Apichakim Akaryam. So this uh, composition is a very brief composition in which the great master Adi Shankaracharya. talks about uh, a very brief question and a briefer answer and one of the question is kimupadeyan that means what is it that you should always obey and follow and the answer simply one word is guru vachanam so in other words 
if you follow the words of the guru that is the best thing that can happen to you there is nothing more that you need to progress in this life and uh, one more verse he talks about kim manujeshu ishtatamam what is it that people like a lot which everybody likes a lot is a question answer to that is swa para hitayodyatatam janma that means taking birth in which you are constantly given an opportunity to look after the welfare of others in addition to your own now if you these two verses if you keep they embody the teachings of bhagwan bhagwan has said so many times about our life how our life should be and what is it that we should do for fulfillment in life you see most of us are privileged to be born in good families get good education go through life without too many vicissitudes like sitting below uh, 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 street light to study those things we are not experienced bhagwan has been gracious enough to give us everything that is needed for us to live happily and in a situation like that what is it that we should actually look for now it swami often said education is not for living education is for some higher purpose and that higher purpose is when we start looking towards god words now no other species in this world has the thinking capacity to reflect and see what direction am i going pause in the busy life that you have and do a simhavalokanam and see just like the lion looks around casually and looks back and forth and says what happened yesterday how did i live and what is coming in future so that kind of a reflection is absolutely necessary so the main message of bhagwan is that we must look at others and not look at ourselves now before i come and talk about the philosophical truth which swami often uh, exhorted us to understand and read i want to tell you a little bit about my association with bhagwan and the great blessing that i've had uh my late father was introduced to bhagwan and had the occasion to come close to him in the early 60s through the good offices of his dear friend dr r s padmanabhan who all of us know served swami for many many years his family served swami in many capacities his sisters especially and so that was the first introduction to the family and ever since then there was a kind of a great guru shishya relationship between uh, swami and my father somehow my father became his uh, favorite because whenever he saw him he spoke about uh, spoke to him with such great affection and love that it was impossible for us to stay away from swami you know whenever swami those days you know swami used to spend lot of time in vrindavan in bangalore because the colleges were not there in uh, puttaparthi and there was only the ashram and there was no hospital there and so uh, swami started uh, coming and spending lot of time in vrindavan so whenever he was in vrindavan my father never missed an opportunity of course he was a very busy lawyer so he couldn't go on weekdays but weekends he always made it a point to go and whenever he just mentioned to us that you know i heard that baba is there in vrindavan i'm thinking of going for darshan that's all he would say both my wife and i would jump and say no 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 we are coming you want to come with you we want to come with you and uh, swami always uh, you know uh, looked at us with such love and affection so that is how our relationship with bhagwan our journey i would say started now the early days in the early 70s when the college was set up in bangalore bangalore was a very small town those days no i used to go on scooter to uh, brindavan many times from college if i was in college and i heard that swami is there in brindavan afternoon suddenly would uh, you know bunk one last class and uh, ride to brindavan on my lambretta scooter and be in time for darshan and uh, come back you know in a very happy state of mind now those are the memories that i had now if i look at that memory it is it is so vast after that how it changed that uh, uh, over the years 
our uh, nearness to Swami in many ways kept on, uh, you know, increasing. Um, I lost my father rather suddenly in 1996, and uh, it was a very traumatic end for him because he was hale and hearty, argued a case in court, and just collapsed and, you know, left us inside the court hall. And he was not very old. He was only 73. He was keeping good health. He had no health issues. He had no heart problem. But this had to happen. A few days later, after the ceremonies were over, I went to Brunda, uh, to Whitefield, to, sorry, uh, to Prashantinilya for Swami's Darshan. And there was not much contact we had with anybody. And there's a long story. I've written about it in my book, uh, uh, which just now was shown to you, called Story of the Clan. Those of you who are interested may look at it. There's a whole chapter devoted to divine encounters and my life with Swami. Of course, other things are also there. This book is available on Amazon if you want to buy it. And it gives you an idea about uh, how my first meeting to go to have Swami's darshan in Prashanti Niliyam alone without my father's presence. It was very traumatic and uh, nevertheless, uh, Swami blessed. And the first thing he told me when he saw me, I was in tears. He said, uh, why do you worry? Your father is with me. He is safe. He is uh, happy. And you have to lead the life now. So don't worry about him. I know you have lost him. But he is with me. And I am with you. He immediately added. And he held my hand. And then I said, Swami, you are so kind to us in my father's lifetime. I wish and hope and pray to you that you continue to have shower the same affection upon me. Uh, when in his absence. So I said, of course, you are going to be, you know, with the same relationship with me. But now in retrospect, when I think when those words, he meant something more. Because during uh, my father's time, as I said, you know, Swami's most of his activity was confined to uh, Vrindavan. Very few things in Prashanti Niliyam. But after my father's demise, my relationship with Swami moved from Vrindavan to Prashanti Niliyam. And I uh, became a regular feature in Prashant Niliam. And suddenly in the year 2000, when Swami was uh, planning the hospital in Bangalore, one day he called me and he said, I want you to be a trustee of the Satisai Medical Trust. You know, those days they had a separate trust for medical relief and there was a central trust, of course. I was a bit taken aback, you know, I had just lost my father and uh, there was a big responsibility of family and then... I prayed to Bhagwan to say, Swami, I'm not a doctor and I have no experience in running any hospital. You're asking me to be a trustee in the hospital. I don't think I have the capacity to be such a trustee. Swami in his own charming way disarmed me, held my hand and said, Bangaro, you just be there. I will do everything. You don't have to do anything. And when Swami said that, there was really, you know, no second thought in my mind. So I, you know, clasped his feet, prostrated. I said, Swami, whatever you say is my command. And I have no difficulty, but I am only expressing uh, my uh, trepidation as to how I'm going to handle this responsibility. So the journey uh, became closer and closer after that. And of course, there are many positions which Swami uh, very kindly blessed me with. But one thing is that, you know, Swami was all-knowing. There is a, nothing that he did not know. I'll give you, I'll start with one small episode and then go to a few other things about Swami. Those days, Swami used to come for darshan at about 6.40 in the morning in Prashanti Nilayam. So to catch that darshan time, we had to leave home at 3 o'clock. So my wife and I would get ready, pack some breakfast uh, and then leave home at 3 and reach Prashant in Liam just about 6 o'clock. Those days it was a three-hour drive. Now it is less. And uh, quickly change and uh, come to for darshan. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time when Swami would see me seated there and when he come out, he comes to the veranda and he will just stand there. And as though he's speaking to somebody, he'll be muttering 3 a.m., 3 a.m., 3 a.m. And he'll be looking. So most people who are there would be wondering, what is this Swami saying 3 a.m., 3 a.m.? Then he would look at me and give a nice smile, indicating that Swami knew that we were leaving home at 3 o'clock in the morning, sometimes with our young children also, and come there for darshan in time. Now, another thing is, great thing about Bhagwan is that he always looked at things from your point of view. You know, 
being a busy lawyer most of the time meetings were called uh, you know on sundays and whenever swam you wanted to have any discussion or any other formal meeting it would be either a saturday evening or a sunday and uh, most of the time i would be there on sunday so if monday happened to be a holiday and, and first thing is swam would ask me after uh, giving me darshan and if there is any discussion after meeting in the interview room i am program oh he'll say means he wants to know what it is where i am staying i'm going so i would invariably very apologetically tell him swami tomorrow is monday i have to be in court so i said no 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 you go you go you go we leave before 4:30 no 4:30 swami's darshan time was after 4:30 so uh, rahu kalam would start on sunday evening 4:30 so i would say you leave before 4 so you'll reach home before it is dark you know that's how swami used to put as a yes, swami now on on many occasions when i mentioned to swami he would say yeah me pota va as no 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 swami i'm saying ah tomorrow you're staying you've got holiday very good very good you stay here you relax you know you're doing too much work you have to stay here and you know come for darshan stay here and you know just relax don't do anything and even on those occasions he never asked me to go and attend any meeting go to hospital attend meet this person that nothing it was, at least now we have a lot of meetings we have our committee meetings and then we have so many other meetings in the university and others now in those days it was not like that so swami ensured that i enjoyed the bliss of his darshan without any kind of uh, what shall i say distraction or disturbance so that was the loving swami that he knew now many people ask me you are such a busy lawyer you know i used to travel 260 days a year out of bangalore i was last two years of course been different but that was my schedule so how do you manage to go and invariably you know every single time this has happened that whenever my presence in bundavan or prashantin leelam was needed everything was sort of cleared by swami i had that great faith you know one day i was cross examining a witness the judge said you know today saturday you have got to finish it and that day swami suddenly decided to have a meeting at 3 o'clock so when i have started the cross examination mr chakravarti is frantically calling me my phone is ringing in my pocket and the court i couldn't pick it up i went on cross examining and suddenly after some time for no reason the judge just said uh, i'm not continuing this cross examination call some other witness and she just kept the file in front so i was a bit perplexed and i asked my junior i said what happened did i do something wrong or did the witness do something wrong and he said no sir i don't know why suddenly the judge just said she won't take this case and called some other witness so i think we can go so i went out took out my phone from my pocket and i looked at it i saw three four missed calls from mr chakravarti i immediately called him He said, "Yena, I have phone at it." I said, "No, sir, I was on my legs arguing." So Saturday also he had court. Is it? I said, "Yes." Then I said, "What is the matter?" He said, "No, no, Swami wants you here at three o'clock. This is at twelve o'clock in the afternoon." So I said, "Okay." I think Swami has made it possible. I called home. I told my wife, "Be ready. I pack up my lunch. I'm going to eat while driving." And uh, got into the car. I didn't even get on at home in my court dress only. I went straight and reached uh, Ajur Mandir. Knocked on the door. Two minutes before three, they all opened the door and said, "Hey, you come so soon? How did you manage to come?" I said, "No, Swami made it possible to come." So, in other words, you leave it to Him, and He takes care of everything. That's how it works. Now, the same thing happens after Mahasamadhi several years ago. Several years after Mahasamadhi, same thing happened. One day, I had a very difficult case. The judge, Chief Justice, said, "I won't adjourn this case." That very day, I had to come to Prashanti Nilayam. and every all the trustee said no 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 you have to come you can't stay away from this meeting so i decided okay go let us see what happens to the case i got into the makar i told my junior inform the other side lawyer that i have some difficulty i won't be there i'll take some time on the way mr bhagwat was with me about half way down the road suddenly i get a call from the opposite side lawyer so i saw his name and i said oh maybe my junior has told him he is calling me to cross check So when I asked him what is the matter, he said, "No, sir. Today I have some problem. There is some health problem, so I am not attending court. So would you mind if I ask the court for an adjournment?" <laughs> I said, "Certainly not. I didn't. I didn't even know that my junior had called him, not called him. I said, 'Okay, please take adjournment. I have no problem.'" And then I went for the my work. And I called my junior. I said, "Did you call him?" I say. He said, "No, sir. I tried his number. I couldn't get his number." I said, "Don't worry. He had called me, and he told me he is taking adjournment." So what I am saying is, he. swami is always present he is always around us he is always inside us he is always there to hear us only thing we need that heart to speak to him you know if you don't have the heart to speak to him it's not possible 
Now, what is Swami's main message? If you see Swami's main message, it is Paropakaraya. That is the first thing. And Papaya Parapedana. Paropakaraya Punyaya. Papaya Parapedana. And Swami often has said that this is the essence of Mahabharata. So if you do Paropakara, helping others, it is Punya. If you harm others, it is Papa. This is a simple message of Bhagwan. Now you see, this message of Bhagwan is the distilled wisdom of uh, enormous amount of learning that one needs to spend a whole lifetime to learn. Now why I am saying that is, you know, I want to emphasize on uh, the learning of our ancient scriptures. Now if you go and ask somebody, do you know Upanishads? No, they'll say, yes, I know Upanishads. Do you know Vedas? Yes, okay, I've heard about Vedas. What is there in the Upanishads? What is Katha Upanishad? What does it say? Now, if you ask them, you and me, we find it difficult to answer such a question because we are not familiar, we have not read it. Now, Bhagwan, in his infinite comp uh, compassion, just have a look at this, Upanishad Vahini. And have a look at this, Sutra Vahini. See, the Prasthana Traya, as they call it, and Gita Vahini is, of course, there. The Prasthana Traya are Brahma Sutras, Upanishads, and Bhagavad Gita. Now, Swami has written the distilled wisdom of these three compositions in such a simple language that even a college student will understand it. Now, if you just try to read some of these things, you will understand that what Swami is saying, what Swami is preaching to us to follow is the distilled wisdom of all these. For example, you know, there is one beautiful shloka in Kathopanishad. Atmanam ratinam vidhi shariram ratame vatu buddhim tu saratim vidhim manah pragrahame vacha indriyani hayan nyahuhu vishayam ste shugocharan Atmendriya mano yuktam bhokte tyahur manishinaha. Beautiful imagery the Upanishad gives. Swami has spoken about it in this Upanishad Vaini. How simply he has explained it and how catching it is. What he says, this sloka simply says, you imagine your body to be a ratha. Okay, now your body is a ratha and uh, he describes various parts of it. Shariram Ratha. The Atma is the one who is riding it. Buddhim is the Sarathi. And Manaha is the one which holds the reins. Like this it goes. What are these uh, uh, self sense organs? They are Indriyani. They are like the horses in the chariot. And it, it goes on like this. See, what I am saying, trying to put forth for your kind consideration is, that there is such a fund of knowledge that Swami has given us. What do we learn from Swami? You know, all these Vahinis which Swami has written are written in his own longhand Telugu language. It's not somebody dictating something. And Kasturi Garu has translated it into such simple, beautiful English. It's so easy for us to read and understand. Same thing with the next Prasthanatraya is uh, uh, Brahma Sutra. Now, in this, uh, Bhagwan so beautifully exclaims, what is Mimamsa? And there is one uh, verse which Swami often used to repeat, Brahmaiva vit, Brahmavit, Brahmaiva Bhavati. That means, if you realize who is Brahman, you yourself became Brahman. In fact, you must have heard many of Swami's discourses. He says, you are all God. Prema Sarupalara. You are the embodiments of the divine. This is nothing but the distilled wisdom of the Brahma Sutras on which Adi Shankaracharya and others have written uh, elaborate commentaries on this. But if you see Bhagwan's commentary in Sutra Vahini, it is so simple, so easy. You don't have to, you know, go into any great texts and everything. See, this is very elevating for the mind. Why I say it is elevating is, after all, in the midst of all our busy schedule in our life, in our learning and everything else. What is it that we should learn from Bhagwan? Bhagwan came to teach. See, he gave discourses. There are thousands of them. He wrote all these Vahinis. I don't know how many of you know. Swami wrote the first few years the Sanatan Sarthi in his own hand. It's all manuscript written by him in Telugu and printed. Why did he take all the trouble of doing all these things? 
Why did he go on repeating to this? Because we are dull-headed, you know. If somebody tells us once, we don't listen. If they tell us twice also, we don't listen. They have to keep on denying it into our head. Swami did that. Do this. Every single discourse of Swami, he said, you are the embodiment of God. How are you going to realize that you are the embodiment of God? The only way you can go, going to realize it is by looking and treating everybody else as a divine being. Why do we have call it Narayana Seva? All the people who deserve treatment from us, they are Narayanas. In fact, Swami says, when you do Narayana Seva, you must thank the Narayana to whom you are giving something because he is giving you an opportunity to do service to redeem yourself. Not for redeeming him. Of course, his hunger may be appeased. He may have some clothes. That is a different thing. But because of him, you have got this thing in your head that you are going to do something to somebody else to help and serve somebody else. Help ever, hurt never. These are the things which Swami talked about. Now, in, in that context, if you see, where was the need for Swami to set up any hospital? Where was the need for him to set up any educational institution? Where was the need for him to set up the uh, Satya Sai Seva organization? Swami did not want anybody to come and do personal seva to him. It was a great privilege that he bestowed on a few people to do Pada Seva and other service for Swami. But other than that, there was nothing that he needed. He was so simple, you know, Swami was so simple, so simple. It's unbelievably simple. You know, after Mahasamadhi, I mean, this is very poignant. We were, uh, we had to go and see, you know, all the, make an inventory of everything. We found several Swami's robes. And the button that Swami was wearing, that was also kept in his room. So we reverentially took it and we found that one of the chains in that button had broken. So then we were told that when Swami was told, Swami, we have to change this button. He said, no, 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 it's okay. What if they're serving its purpose? No, what if the chain is broken? I'm wearing the button. So he didn't allow them to change this button with the chain. He said, I don't need it. Why do I need it? This is okay for me. I'm just wearing it. It's fine. What times? And at the same time, people gave so many things to him, jewelry, gold, all sorts of things were given. You know, they were just, they were lying around like some piece of waste paper. He had not even opened many of those things. He had just put them in a cupboard. Nothing. It, it meant nothing to him. What meant what Swami treasured was the sentiment with which you did something for Swami. All of you know that Swami often referred to this also. That when Swami was building hospital, some of the boys in the hostel decided they're going to give some something to Swami. Of course, they are also poor. I mean, they're not very affluent. So some one boy stopped giving his clothes to the dobi and he washed it himself and ended it himself. And whatever money he saved, he put in an envelope and gave it to Bhagwan. Bhagwan showed that envelope and said, you know, this is the kind of boys that we have. This is my students. This is how they're, you know, uh, reacting to what I'm saying. See this uh, attitude of theirs. So in other words, main message of Swami was give, give, give. And he's forcing us. He's telling us, you also have to give. Therefore, he said, hospital. What do hospital do? All the people who serve in the hospital have to keep giving there. And they have to do seva. Same thing with education. You know, if you give education, it is for life. If you give somebody food, it is for that day. So Swami believed in it. And there's no other institution which can today boast of education and healthcare completely free of cost. There's no educational institution like that at all. It cannot be so. Now, one other aspect one needs to look up. See, Swami was the founder of the Central Trust. He was the founder of many state trusts. He was the sole trustee of Central Trust for a very long period of time, except for a brief period when there were others in it. And one year before Mahasamadhi, Swami inducted uh, trustees into the Central Trust who are going to take over after him. Now, they, they were that was the change that Swami made. But how did Swami alone manage all these institutions? Can you imagine? There are two super speciality hospitals, uh, uh, three campuses of universities, and uh, all this uh, public service project like water and this and that, everything. And for all of you, those of you who don't know, there was not one rupee in the central trust which was spent without Swami's signature. Not one rupee. Because what would happen is every month, there would be a statement that is given. He would know how much is the last month's salaries that we paid, last month's expenditure. He would compare all that. Accountants was called. And in, his, in their presence, in Swami's presence, they would write a check. And Swami used to sign the check himself for transfer of the funds to one operating account. 
thereafter the directors and others were suspended so in other words unless swami was convinced that this money is to be spent because he always said this money is very sacred money this money is given by devotees out of their devotion to me they want to do something good i can't spend 1 rupee more than that and i still remember when suddenly a, a, a move came somebody suggested swami your car has become very old so you need to change your car so i was there in brindavan that day and many people gave many suggestions so somebody gave one suggestion about one car swami said hey adu chana pedda di car i don't need such a big car i don't want such a car i got big car i want to change it to small car this is what swami said so what i'm saying is see the attitude of swami and swami said my life is my message what does that mean that means you have to live like swami he used to eat uh, half chapati and uh, three spoons of rice with a little bit of uh, parpu and uh, some sambar or something and uh, curd that that even a five year old child will eat more than that that was what swami used to eat for lunch because we had the great privilege of sitting with him for so and before we could start the first course he would have finished the last course washed his hands and he'll be getting up <laughs> then he would say no 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 you sit down you sit down you eat you eat slowly so what i'm saying my life is my message is exactly that live like how i live now these projects that were done now for example the seva dal that is there no seva dal is is an organization where if you become a seva dal you volunteer to be one you are going there to do something you are going there to do some seva offer something to god to someone now many people go to hospital they say how beautifully the seva dal people are looking after the patients there so swami did not need seva dal for his seva the organization is set up to give us an opportunity to be of some service to others so that we redeem our lives now one important thing what did i learn from swami in terms of management style is something which we need to look at you know there were so many institutions as i said there is the institute of higher learning there is a vice chancellor for it there is a board of management for it there is a finance committee for it and central trust had a council of management of which i was blessed to be a member for many years and the trust itself now all these institutions are there how does swami run this institution alone is a thing which is which is amazing because there are so many things that are happening including ashram administration how many guests have come what kind of food is given how is the rooms kept are they maintained properly who is the vip coming who is going all this is needed to be monitored by bhagwan of course people like mr chakravarti mr chiranjeev rao were that in the ashram but nevertheless nothing happened without swami's direct involvement and blessing how did that happen swami's style of management was a fantastic style i haven't seen it anywhere else if there was an issue it uh, if if uh, I, i was sounded for example and swami would say you know we have to do something like this what do you say or if swami didn't ask sometimes we had some issues so we would go and uh, take time and uh, request swami that i need to you know place this before you then he'll give you a time and then you go and place something he will think about it and then he will say did you discuss if it's an important issue some very uh, you know an ordinary thing he will take a decision this is some important policy matter something he will say uh, did you discuss this with the chakravarti shrinivas and anche paro that means he expected us to involve other people it's not one person giving some advice and there should be some kind of a view that all of us express so once then when when i later i started realizing this and then i started uh, discussing this with mr chakravarti and other saying see tomorrow i'm coming this is what i'm going to place before bhagwan i'm just forewarning you because after i meet bhagwan at lunch time if he asks him anything he should have he should have some clue about what exactly i'm saying so this kind of a consensus was done then after swami considers this he will say okay you discuss with so and so and come back then we go back and we huddle and then we uh, think about it and say what is the best thing to do should we suggest this to bhagwan not to do what how to do things like that then everything is over we come back to him say then i'll tell him swami i discussed with all these people these are the view points that emerged but i think this is what should be the solution this is how it should be done then he'll say amanchidi then he will then find out for himself that what i have said is correct 
because if i mislead him and tell him something which didn't happen then he should be he should know that so he would make sure and the great thing was that there was a consensus building you see a great manager is one who ensures that there is consensus and sometimes there are different perspectives swami will call all of us make us sit there and then he will expound his viewpoint then everything will fall into place so what i'm saying is this consensus building is something which is a fantastic tool which swami used to ensure that uh, the the affairs of the trust at the secular level are very uh, cleanly run one other important message which we can never forget with swami is whenever he 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 raised suppose there is a doubt somebody raised usually some income tax doubt will be there some finance person some doubt will be there some other issue some legal issue will be there so he will ask what well, oh, this problem is there what do you think we should do so then uh, i'll apply my mind and i'll tell swami like this then he will say are you sure that by doing this you will not be violating any law first question is that don't violate any rule or law we should not be acting contrary to law first sometimes you know in law its gray area is always there it could be this way it could be that way and there are two interpretations possible so then i would mention to bhagwan swami itla no cheptu atlo is okay which what should we do i mean this is okay then he would say no 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 not like that you tell me that course which has no chance of being opposite view from what government may take or authorities may take that means the path that you take must definitely be not one which is capable also of being held to be wrong if there is a slightest chance don't do it why give room for that if something is likely to go wrong you think it is not going to go wrong and you go along that path then you will realize that sometimes if it goes against you then you'll say are i took a chance and now this is a position you are in so swami's second management rule was fantastic rule i don't know how far you can implement it in the commercial world but the rule is if there are two views possible one is doubtful another one definitely you are going to be right then you take that one which is definitely right don't take the one which is not right then uh, in addition to these management styles you know swami had he had some is divine you know some kind of a relationship he built with you the you know in the thousands of people who were sitting in kulvanthal every single person wherever he or she was sitting would think swami is looking at her would would feel that he could he or she could communicate with bhagwan and bhagwan would hear and understand it and bhagwan was able to actually see and perceive everything you know by just standing in front of somebody and looking at somebody all those problems are resolved just like how in dakshana murti it is said no guru astu maunam vyakhyanam shishya astu chinna samshaya many times you know you sit in front of the guru in total silence all your problems are resolved your doubts are resolved shishya astu chinna samshaya is samshaya is gone how does that happen it happens because of communication now many times it has happened to me in fact once what happened was i was waiting i had to place something important before bhagwan and i went there on a sunday morning i realized as i was entering veranda there was a chair placed where i would normally sit so i realized that some vvip has come whatever it is so i thought to myself in my mind immediately that thought came to me oh god today i don't think i'm going to get swami's time because that vvip is there swami will call him in it will be 9 o'clock bhajan then uh, swami will go for uh, lunch and it won't be possible i this thought occurred to me anyway i sat just behind the chair a few minutes later that vip came and he was seated and swami came for darshan he didn't uh, look at him he just uh, give gave darshan in the veranda and went straight to the room then sent for him and he was called in with his family members i thought now door is closed 9 o'clock only it will open just at bhajan time believe it or not as this thought was crossing my mind in a few minutes time less than 5 minutes door opened swami himself opened the door and you know he had that beautiful way of opening the door standing like this and saying at the door so he did that allowed these people to go out then he stood there and I'm, and by then the chair was removed so i was right in front of the door so he's looking at me he doesn't say anything to me he's just smiling looking at me then he turned said mm, ra that's all he said so i went 
So I went inside, Swami sat in his uh, throne. I sat at his feet, I prostrated, I touched his feet. And then I wanted to say something which was in my mind. Then uh, Swami started talking about something. He started talking about me, my family, this work, so many things he started talking. Then after he kept quiet. So when Swami kept quiet, I took the bless of bliss, the bliss of bliss, the, the blessing of bliss, and sat quietly. He did not utter a single word for more than half an hour, or 20 minutes or so at least. I was also quiet because still Swami says, you speak, it's not appropriate for us to say, mm, yeah, chepo, then we can say something. No, he didn't say anything. Then at the end of it, he looked at the watch. You know, he had a habit, really, you look at the watch. He looked at the watch, five minutes to nine. He said, ah, chepo, yem, yem, chepo. What is it you want to tell me? You wanted to say something, no, you tell me that. So then I placed something before him. Before I could finish two sentences, he picked up that and said, okay, okay, yeah, we'll do that. With that. It's a good idea. You can do that. He said, and then, ah, chudo, nine o'clock. Bhajan outundi, come, we'll go for bhajan. And it was over. Now, everybody is thinking that I am, you know, Swami is blessing me with some long interview about something, this thing, that thing. Or they think I'm talking about uh, uh, trust and other things, you know, so many things I have to talk. But it was not so. It was only Swami's blessing. That's all there was to it. So, and then one word he said, just before, I forgot to mention this. As I sat down, he said, hmm. Minister Ro, Ostaru, Potaru, Ostaru, Potaru. Miru, devotee, Akada, Ikadna, Untaru. This is what he told me. So, in other words, in Swami's mind, these big people who come, you know, many times people ask, why all these, you know, big people, some of them with dubious records, all of them come and Swami, why he has to see them and why he has to bless them, why he has to treat them like this? So, the simple answer we get it in the Upanishads also he is, that when God comes to bless somebody, right, he has to look after those who are downtrodden also. The people who are leading a righteous life, who are following the path of Dharma, for them, God is uh, omnipresent in their life. He's, they are always in their heart. So there's nothing much that has to be done. But whereas, Somebody who is not like that, God has to take little more effort. You know, in that uh, famous episode, when Krishna is lying down and uh, war is declared, both uh, Dharmaraja and uh, Duryodhana come to Krishna to ask for assistance. In that episode also, if you have uh, read from Mahabharata, you will see Krishna is pretending to be sleeping. Duryodhana comes and sits by his head. And Arjuna comes and sits by his feet. And then he gets up and makes drama, this, that. And okay, the rest of the story goes on like that. That means you who are inside, God is inside you. You know, uh, after all the hundred uh, Kauravas die, their mother is asked, you know, all this has happened. You know, what, what is all this? She utters one word only. Yato dharmaha tato jayaha. So she knows that her sons were on the path of adharma. Therefore, they can never win. The path of dharma will win. So what I'm saying is that when Bhagwan is blessing somebody, it is he who is in need of blessing. In fact, I, I, I should conclude, I think now, it's only one few words. You know, there was a very strange thing happened when I was president of the Rotary Club. Uh, I asked Bhagwan, can I get all my club members? They want to have darshan. He said, yes. So it's a long story. I'll cut it short. So we all of us came and Bhagwan blessed us with an interview. There are about 25-30 couples in that small room. Swami picked out two people and he called them. He, he asked about their personal things. He blessed both of them with a ring. And we were all wondering. Everybody was playing the fool. Yeah, no, Swami is blessing only these two people. He is not giving us. Of course, he gave all the ladies saris and all. That's a different thing. But among the men, only these two got special treatment. Everything was over, everything forgotten. You know, these two people had the greatest problems in their life. One of them developed blood cancer years later. And of course, he was a great human being, a great devotee. And his devotion saved him. He's still alive. Thank God. Thanks, Swami. He come, came out of it. He had a bone marrow transplant. The other person is also a very fine man, a child accountant. His daughter had just got married. 
she got into matrimonial problems these are the and rest of the group whoever was there nothing happened to any of them and swami didn't give them anything also so what is the answer one gets from this is that when swami blesses somebody it is with a purpose it is something that is needed for that person so don't think that swami is blessing only some big man small man this man that man is nothing like that it's it's, it's swami's compassion is always you know overflowing and that that is exactly what we need to learn from swami i think i have to conclude now by just uh, citing uh, one small doha from kabir sab dharti kagaz karu lekhani sab ban rai saat samund ki masi karu guru guna likha na jaye what a beautiful doha it is no that means the whole universe the earth if you make it into paper all the oceans you make it into ink all the trees in this world you make it into pens and you start writing the guna of the guru the characteristics of the guru the greatness of the guru it will not be sufficient so when we are blessed with such a great sadguru who is so compassionate who is so approachable who is so much part of our life he knows everything you know i can i can go on talking for another 2 hours about episode after episode after episode where swami is showing that he knows what is going on in your mind why can we not control our mind we need to control our mind we need to control our thoughts we need to control our actions we need to think of good things to do be good think good speak good swami always said that no if somebody insults you just say sai ram and keep quiet if somebody praises you you say no no you are praising me like oh, you should not have made such a big video about me and all it's not necessary i am feeling embarrassed you know with a swami devotees you should you should just say two lines he is a lawyer trustee of central trust that's all the rest of it is all it's all immaterial in bhagwan's place what is what is bhagwan and what are we we are nothing you know it is important for us to lose track of ourselves in front of bhagwan that is most important you know humility is something which is absolutely essential and these are the lessons which we learn from bhagwan and there is the lessons are unending so i will only conclude by exhorting all the young people who are there and all the not so young people also who are there please 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 take bhagwan's vahinis please read them read them slowly enjoy the beautiful essence of sanatana dharma which swami has put it is universal you know it is not hinduism this concept of advaita the concept of god being immanent in everything the concept of god being you know uh, the creator of everything and he is the cause of everything anoraniyan mahato mahiyan that's what he says there's a beautiful song in kannada tena bina trunam api na chalati nothing moves not even a blade of grass this is this is the thing how do you experience all this you can only experience this by reading imbibing and putting a heart and soul in the course of a day please spend 15 minutes of your time for any spiritual practice is it too much to ask for 15 minutes to 20 minutes spiritual practice i have a daily worship at home whatever i do whatever time even when i am going at 5 o'clock somewhere in the morning flight if i had to take i finish my worship at 4 4:30 and then i leave the daily puja this is some discipline which we should have swami expected this discipline from us let us if we are true devotees of bhagwan let us take a pledge today that we are going to follow this path we are going to find that little bit of time for our own sadhana sadhana is necessary for us we have to progress on the spiritual path and that can only happen if you give time attention devotion and take hold of swami's hand swami's hand is always available all these publications are there please take them use them read them and follow them thank you sai ram om shri sai ram well what sai ram sai ram avinam um thank you thank you so much sir uh, uh, for your kind words you know being a, a law professional myself you know a quick tips a tips from your end uh, relating to sadhana your learnings of life you know will definitely help me and i'm sure a lot of other brothers and sisters will also benefit from what you rendered to us today thank you so much sir 
uh, your brothers and sisters, uh, the floor is open for uh, question and answers. Uh, please raise your hands. Uh, we'll call you one by one to post your questions. Uh, you can also post your questions on the chat box. Um, we'll take it one by one. Requesting to please keep it short and crisp uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, keeping in mind the paucity of time, uh, we'll be able to uh, put it across to sir uh, uh, one by one. Uh, the floor is open, brothers and sisters. Okay, uh, we have the first uh, hand raised, sir. Uh, it's OD NLP 22M13. Uh, requesting brother to please unmute yourself and um, speak out your question. Sairam, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Sairam, sir, I'm feeling very excited having in this section with you. My question is, as for a long time you have been with Swami, so I have to ask you that uh, ever Swami told, why fear when I am here? Always Swami is with us. But in some sentences of Udhav Gita, Krishna told that he couldn't attend the Pandavas in the dice play because they didn't call him. He attended the Draupati because he called him and Swami always tells us that you need not ask me anything but I will give you. Please make me clarified in this sentence. Sairam sir. I think you know you have to understand these words in their right context. Now if you don't ask Swami he may give you, he may not give you. Just like they say that if a baby is hungry, if it doesn't cry, the mother doesn't feed the baby. So you got to ask. No, Swami is there to give you. But you must ask for the right thing. Swami often said, people come to ask me for so many things, but nobody is coming here to ask me to give what I have come to give. What I have come to give is give you peace, give you happiness, give you deliverance, give you the knowledge so that you know that you are truly Brahman. So the answer is that these episodes that you are referring to, they have to be read in that context. So for Swami, it makes no difference. Even if you don't ask, he will give you. But if you perceive Swami as being close to you, see what happens is many times you are in distress. You are somebody's very close person is not well. He or she is in hospital. Doctors have said, you know, we don't know what will happen. At that time, you are in a state of distress. That is the time when you should call upon Swami and say, I'm in distress. So I need your guidance, your blessing. And ultimately, you know, Jatasya Dhruva Mrityuhu. The minute you are born, death is certain. So you cannot postpone the death by if I, anything. But the capacity to bear the vicissitudes of life will come when you feel and perceive that God is with me all the time. That's, that's what is really the answer. Thank you, sir. Sairam. Thank you, sir. Um, we have Brother Mayank from Rajasthan. Please unmute yourself and post a your question, brother. Uh, Sairam. Sairam, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, for a young individual, who has not had the chance to interact with Swami in the physical form, to realize that divinity walked amongst us on two feet, for whom sages had worshipped for years just to get that darshan. To realize all that, it seems almost unimaginable, unbelievable. So in your words, if you were to make us, the youngst youngsters, understand the gravitas of the divine era, that we are living in. That is what I want to know. Shraddhavan Lavate Jnanam. Nothing, even Shirdi Baba said, Shraddha and Saburi. Two things are very important. Now, you see, without devotion, it is not possible for you to go near God. You have to start with the presumption that you are devoted 
that you, that uh, you believe that it is true now it is like this you know swami often said don't try to understand me you can never understand me uh, don't you can only experience me now you look at swami you look at his uh, his uh, what shall i say his divine personality and uh, you see it's like this you know if somebody asks you to describe a monkey okay you can probably describe it in 10 words or 15 words but if somebody asks you to describe a uh, tyrannosaurus or a dinosaur something like that which existed some several million years ago which you don't know you have never seen you only seen some pictures kalpanic pictures you have seen imagine it how will you describe not possible same thing with god you cannot describe god you can only experience god you can experience the sweetness somebody says describe sugar how much ever you describe that person will never get an idea but if you take one small pinch of it put it in your mouth then you will realize what is sweetness no same thing with bhagwan also see there is no ground for skepticism god is there he is in front of you you are experiencing him otherwise when you go to tirupati how do you see god there you are seeing god there you are perceiving god there you are you know uh, uh, what shall i say communing with god there how does that happen it is only out of faith so you have got to have sadhana and you have got to have faith and patience both these shraddha and saburi very important thank you so much sir we have another question in the chat box um uh, sairam sir uh, can you please share your time management skills and how you were able to manage different verticals in life i think you know as we get busier and busier we need to do multitasking if you don't do multitasking you just cannot manage like in the last two years i got four systems in front of me now i got only one here three others are sitting here now i am looking at four courts what is happening and in the middle when i am waiting i got another file on which i am working my mind is in here seeing what is happening sometimes i got two microphones in different courts and i am reading something here so that means simultaneously the brain has capacity to do four five things that is very important now take for example a musician he is singing he is remembering the words he is constructing a raga and he is delineating it he is putting taala he is conscious of his co musicians what they are doing uh, you know where they are pausing that means human mind is used to multitasking only thing you got to train it and once you train it it is possible for you to you know optimize your time that is one secondly it's god's grace i gave you two examples no both are cases where my heart and my desire was there to go but it was not possible so swami cleared the road it's like you know uh, the, the the red light being just changed to green light by the policeman you know some vip is coming or some ambulance is uh, buzzing behind you so immediately the policeman at the junction will change your red light to green light and say go 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 no so like that swami is always doing that and this is happening you know day in and day out it's happening we are experiencing it every day so you have to leave it to him to tell him you want me to do this i am prepared to do this i'll take one step forward there is a beautiful song of one of the dasas in kannada where it says that he the dasa is saying that if you are lying down and you are talking thinking about god or praising him no god is standing next to you and listening to you if you sit down and you think about him god is sort of moving around you if you stand up and start singing god is actually dancing with ecstasy that means our one step will make him 10 steps closer to us so time management skills important you need to prioritize what you are going to do how you are going to do when you are going to do and most of the times you know i have i wake up little early and uh, i switch on my phone uh usually around 5 5:15 i switch it on by 6:15 i finished all the mails that are there i switch off my phone then then 
I go for my morning uh, walk and ablutions and puja and everything and switch it on just before I'm ready to go out. That means by the time I get out of the house, there's nothing pending on my file. So it's a question of how you structure your time. And one more thing, you know, I, I sincere piece of advice, I, I told many young people, you know, there's push notifications which keep coming to you, you know, for heaven's sake, just stop seeing them, you know. Google will give you one million pieces of information which you don't need. You know, and, and the minute you open one of them, then you'll get 10 more of the same because they're mapping what you're reading. And all of that is unnecessary. You have to prioritize that this is something which I, for example, Sai inspires I get. Sai message a day I get. Bhajan a day I get. These three, I the last thing I do before I switch off the phone is listen to them and read them. And one more, Mr. Krishnamurti sends it, you know, Tumuluru. That is a fantastic, you know, uh, message that he sends every day. Uh, Sai the Omni. Those of you who are not subscribed, I think, please subscribe. It's a very, very beautifully selected small portion from Swami's writing. It's, it's superb. So, these three things you read and switch off your phone. So, that's, that's I think, how you need to handle this time. Thank you, sir. Uh, One more question I see on the chat box. You want to take that? Uh, we have Sister Sharanya, uh, sir. She has been raising her hand okay. for quite some time. Okay. okay. Uh, Sister Sharanya, please unmute yourself and post your question. Uh, Sairam, sir, uh, my question is: um, Should we have ambition or uh, surrender everything at Swami's feet? No, you certainly have to have ambition, and you certainly have to put in effort. There's no doubt about that at all. No. The Swami always used to say this. Uh, one saying of his was a uh, uh, beautiful saying he used to give. Uh, this, uh, Yatna prayatnamu manava dharmamu jayapa jayamu daivadinamu. Yatna and prayatna, both they mean yatna is little more effort, prayatna is the same thing. This is manava dharma, that is your dharma. You need to do that. If you don't do that, then you're failing in your duty. Then whether you get the result or you don't get the result, that is not in your hand. Karma neva adhikaraste mahapaleshu tadachana. That's Bhagavad Gita says. Swami has put it in this fashion. So you have to have ambition. You have to put in effort. Now you want to, you know, uh, pass chandra content examination. All your friends are going for a movie. You also want to go for a movie. Most probably you won't pass the CA exam. That's what will happen. But if you tell your friend, sorry boys, I'm not coming with you. You enjoy your movie. I'm going to enjoy my studies. After exam is over, I'll come to see you. Then you may pass the exam. So in other words, there's always a trade-off. And you need to be clear about it. And you need to put that effort. So I think ambition plus effort. And then don't think of the result. If it comes good, if it doesn't come, okay, next, better luck next time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll take the question in the chat box. Sairam, sir, you said God is omnipresent. Um, yet most of them are facing physical problems like financial, family, diseases, leading to failure of peacefulness. Uh, why such things are happening? How to take such type of things when happens? And while we are at extreme sorrow? A few days ago, there was a program of Sondara Lahiri in that the Jagadguru Sanidhanam of Shangeri spoke. And he gave a beautiful illust illustration. I think it's, it's worth repeating it. Now, this past karma which you have, you are saying, today I'm in difficulty, I'm facing problem. right? This problem, if you believe in karma theory, is because of your prarabdha karma, sanchita karma. These what have come behind you, your baggage which you are carrying, which you don't know when it came from. This janma, some other janma, what papa you did, what wrong things you did, all that baggage is lying. Now, you are standing on the banks of a river. You want to cross over to the other side. You are trying to swim across the river. If you are a good swimmer, you will go. If the lake is placid, you will go through quickly. But if there is a big flow of water coming down the river in the current, and if you want to cross, what will you do? You will have to use more effort. That means you have to become a very good swimmer and use all your strength to go across. Now, this is just like that. When you don't know the amount of flow that is there, because you don't know your past karma. So, don't blame God or anybody else for the difficulties which you are facing today. 
that is due to some past baggage which you are carrying how can you get rid of this swami has said this also that if with god's grace everything is gone in fact he has said i can i can vanish all your karma in one second but that has to come from god's grace so the thing is if you face difficulties you can't go and blame god you have to blame yourself for it then how to overcome it is you have to do good you have to be on the right path you have to follow dharma and you have to follow everything that you are supposed to do help others do collect all the it's like debit and credit balance you know these are all debit balances so the more credit you collect the debit balance gets nullified but unfortunately in this game you don't know how much debit balance you got it's like this you know if you know you got 1 lakh loan then you have to earn 1 lakh and repay you earn 1 lakh but you don't know how much the loan is if the loan is say 100 lakhs with all your effort you earned 1 lakh you repaid 1 lakh still 99 lakhs is remaining for that to clear in it god's grace <laughs> that's how the accounting works thank you so much sir for addressing our doubts and dogmas such in such a clear manner thank you so much you know it i i believe it shall be helpful uh, for all of us thank you so much uh, before calling uh, brother avinam for his closing comments i would like to invite our very loving gopi uncle to share a few words with us gopi uncle sairam thank you anita sairam sir uh but first of all uh, it was a mesmerizing and a very insightful uh, talk uh, this evening i just wanted to mention to you sir that uh, the guidance that you are giving to all these youngsters will go a long way in shaping their lives uh, this course actually had a one month gyanavahini parayanam even before we started the course and as you have advised we have, we have advised all the participants to go through the different vahinis and we are also uh, making it available for them in pdf format so that they don't need to buy the books and they can read it whenever they are free so this is one part of it that i want to give you sir the rest of the things you know sir uh, having been so close to swami and uh, the inputs that you have given the insights of how swami actually led a simple life is uh, sometimes gives us uh, being in this concrete jungle of life the corporate life whatever we see when god leaves such a simple life you know his message is so dear to us and uh, we pay definitely and you wanted us to make a promise to ourselves that you no know, uh, we definitely want our lives to be his message and uh, we are definitely going in that path right now in this leadership program for self transformation though we call it a leadership program the entire program is only for self transformation and that is what we are impacting upon right now uh, soon we'll be having a Uh, so, uh, at the end of this course, we'll be having a valedictory function, and we'll be very happy, sir. Uh, you should come again and uh, address the students in person again. We just finished the last year's uh, program about a couple of months back in April, and uh, on behalf of all those organizing team members and all the president, we'll be very happy if you are there physically, personally, to address the students once again when we come up next in the program. With these few words, uh, thanking you. Uh, divine blessings on you and your family for a wonderful work and wonderful uh, message of the divine master that you are taking forward as a Sunday Trust member. I now take it forward. Uh, request Avinam to uh, propose a word of thanks. Over to Avinam. Thank you. Om Shri Sai Ram. Offering my most reverential pranams at the divine lotus feet of our most beloved Bhagwan. the karuna mai the daya sagara bhagwan shri satya sai baba well brothers and sisters what a wonderful way to end the week as well as to start the week to hear from an exemplary reader crafted by bhagwan himself well brothers and sisters it's an honor and a privilege for all of us to hear from sir shri nag anand trustee of the shri satya sai central trust and the trust member of the shri satya sai institute of higher learning well firstly i would like to offer our collective love and pranams at our most beloved bhagwan for giving us this beautiful opportunity to hear from such a exemplary leader who has led us and has shown us how bhagwan had always done his work well i would personally like to thank sir from the behalf of the shri satya sai 
National Leadership Program for Self-Transformation for bringing Swami closer to us and sharing such beautiful stories and experiences which has projected Swami as an ideal leader who has always showered love and has guided us to the right path. Before ending, I would like to also thank our most beloved convener of the program, Dr. Gopi Krishna Pitatala, for always guiding us and always pushing us to do our best. Well, brothers and sisters, we have just finished with the project management course yesterday and this morning. Well, wishing you all for the best for your project management days that we are going to witness in days to come. With these words, let us once again all pray to Swami with our folded hands and with all of our love to bless us with such exemplary leaders who can always guide us to his path and always lead our life as Swami would always wanted us to lead. With this beautiful words and always a pining smile and love, let us all once again pray to Swami. I now kindly request our audiovisual team to proceed with the Shanti Mantra. Jai Sai Ram. Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Oh